The early 2000s, a golden age of banking. Banks were getting bigger through consolidation, investment banking operations were thriving, fueled by a buoyant subprime lending market. But in just a short period, everything went wrong as wholesale money markets froze, and so began banking's annus horribilis. One of the first signs was the run on Northern Rock, as people queued in the streets trying to withdraw their savings. Well, the wholesale markets flows in, in August 2007, and what then happened was we saw the value of large, large amounts of subprime mortgages, which were not only held by investors, but were held by banks in their, in their treasury books, um, start to decline. And we started to see you know, considerable, considerable concern about liquidity at other banks. And we then got through to the stage where Bear Stearns, a very big name, uh, found itself in deep trouble, a big player in the mortgage market in March of 2008, uh, was taken over by JP Morgan, and then a very jittery summer through to the point in time where Lehman Brothers, of course, went into bankruptcy. And this was really just, if you want, a whole deck of cards falling. So what was the tipping point for Royal Bank of Scotland? So RBS had been basking in the glory of doing a very good job of taking over NatWest, and it had started to do one or two other large transactions, particularly in the United States. And of course, it then launched a bid for ABN AMLO, a hostile bid, because Barclays had already agreed a bid for ABN AMLO. The main reason for the acquisition by Royal Bank was they wanted to expand their US business by taking on ABN AMLO's business in the Midwest, LaSalle. Unfortunately, what happened was that as a, as a defensive mechanism, ABN agreed to sell that to Bank of America as part of their merger with Barclays. So really, at this stage, one has to ask the question why Royal Bank proceeded, because there wasn't really much else in ABN AMLO it really wanted. How did this then start this domino effect for RBS going through the doldrums? Well, the problems for RBS once they got, got ABN AMLO on board was that the markets were very, very weak at the end of 2007. Our banks. Uh, were starting to have to take marks to market, in other words, losses through their, their P&L on the assets on their balance sheet, subprime loans in particular, or subprime uh, mortgage-backed securities. And this accelerated into the, the start of 2008, and that resulted in the Royal Bank having to raise 12 billion of additional capital through a rights issue. Unfortunately, that was not enough um, to stem the, the problems that they had, and uh, by, the, by the autumn, they were running into severe difficulties, really in parallel to Lehman Brothers. What do you think the, the key reason why RBS failed and the government had to stand in? Unlike banks like Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns that had run into problems that were predominantly wholesale banks serving the institutional market, Royal Bank, of course, had a very, very large uh, retail bank. And basically, the government had to step in to protect depositors. And if you want, more importantly, to protect the financial system. This was our biggest bank. Uh, the government appointed Stephen Hester, an experienced investment banker. The problem was the government actually didn't allow him to do the things which I think most commentators knew he had to do, like uh, rebuild the investment bank and benefit from the earnings stream that would, that would come in and generate more capital and allow him to, if you want, also resuscitate some of the other businesses that were very good but, but had had problems, like their US subsidiary so Citizens Financial. So where's the bank now and what do you think the prospects for it are in the future? I think the bank's actually in pretty good shape. Uh, it's, it's obviously gone right the way back to basics. It wants to be a retail and corporate bank in, in the UK and Ireland. Obviously got rid of some businesses it would have liked to have kept. Again, like Citizens Financial probably. But it's a much simpler bank and getting to the stage where it will effectively be a British and Irish bank serving retail and corporate customers and not having some of the, the more, if you want, um, exciting but volatile businesses that the, the previous Royal Bank of Scotland had. David, speaking to you now and listening to what you've said in the past about recent mistakes during the financial crisis, you famously said, we up. You said, we made some very big and stupid mistakes. How long does this mea culpa actually last? How long do you want to keep apologizing I, I should, for? I just point out, it wasn't the best choice of language uh, to say that, but you know, we are, we're, um, We've got to acknowledge the mistakes that we made and more significantly than that, we've got to learn from them. And probably the key one is if you look at the overall sector, it didn't put the customer at the heart of what was going on. Um, banks put self-interest first and foremost, which is why we have the legacy issues we have. So we've really worked hard to put the customer back at the, the forefront and actually trying to get people to focus internally on that. So if you take you know, these guys and gals here, have never done anything other than try and serve the customers they deal with day in day out. That's never been a problem. They've had to suffer the problem caused by management of days gone by. 
Um, but if you ask our customers when they come in here how they feel, they'll tell you they get great service, they're happy with the delivery we give them and we need to focus on that day in, day out. And actually never forgetting that we did make mistakes and we must acknowledge those. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.